glad you're here to worship the Lord with us this morning. Stand if you will. We're going to begin by singing that chorus we're playing today. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his porch with praise. I will say this is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made the Lord today say amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are glad that you're with us here today on this uh, beautiful windy morning. Uh, when I walked in, I told uh, Brother Lloyd, only in Oklahoma, uh, you can have a nice and sunny the day before and the next day you can get a uh, kite and fly it all day long. So, but thank the Lord that you're all here with us today. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us at Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a first time guest uh, here at our church, there's a, a guest card in the uh, bulletin. Uh, if you would please just fill it out and uh, just turn it in at the end of the service or in the uh, basket as the ushers pass by uh, this uh, morning. Uh, also, I'd like to just mention a special prayer request. Uh, Brother Lydon, please, if you would remember him in prayer. Uh, Sister Hope, uh, she's out there with him right now. So if you would remember them in prayer. Uh, Brother Lydon, uh, he uh, uh, has um, back issues right now. So if you would please just remember him uh, in prayer and that uh, everything will work out okay and the family that's traveling there and back, uh, if you would please. Um, last Sunday, Brother uh, Zach mentioned a story that has just stuck with me all week. The story about Brother uh, Craig Shaw when he went to Russia uh, and how it is that Brother Shaw, when he was out there, he had a different uh, set of clothes for every day. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Christian students that were there they noticed that and they were, they were shocked that he was able to have, you know, different clothes for every day and they wore the same clothes every single day. And I began to think about that, how it is that sometimes we do forget how blessed we are in our country today. How it is that the Lord has blessed us with, uh, with, with, with more than what we can, we can handle. And I began to think about the word uh, content. You know, content. Are you content in your marriage today? Are you content uh, with what you have today? I looked up the word content and basically what it means is satisfied with what one is or has, not wanting more or anything else. That's satisfied. Are you content? Are you satisfied with what you have? When I used to deliver uniforms in Los Angeles, I did that for 16 years and uh, I used to deliver in downtown LA and uh, I saw many things and I remember this one day when I was driving up to my building 
downtown LA in the heart of LA. I noticed to my right, about 8.30 in the morning, cold. There was a guy sitting there on the cold concrete and uh, he was smiling, but when I pulled up, I noticed that there was all these little black dots around him. And he was like looking up and then he looked down and he was, he was just smiling. And, but what caught my attention was, it looked like marbles just all around him and he was smiling and I thought, what's going on with that guy? So when I got out of the truck, he was probably about 20 feet away from me. And as I got out of the truck, you know what he was doing? He had a bag of grapes and he was throwing up in the air and he was trying to catch them in his mouth and he caught some, but he didn't catch others. But what caught my attention was this, is that this man, he didn't have any hands. From here up, he had no hands. But he was smiling and I know he was in his right mind, but he was throwing these grapes up in the air and trying to catch them and he didn't have no hands. Paul the Apostle in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 11, he said, I have learned to be content in whatsoever state that I am. We hear that story about that man who was mad who didn't have any shoes until he saw a man who had, didn't have any feet. Well, this man didn't have any hands. I was upset that day because I'll tell you what, um, driving in LA traffic, it'll get you mad right away. Uh, LA is known for road rage. I believe it was born in LA. And the Lord taught me a lesson that day that I thought, you know what, David, you're okay. You're doing all right. This man here, he has no hands and uh, he's, he's, you know, he's struggling. But Paul the Apostle said, I have learned to be content in whatsoever state that I am. That's a key word. Sometimes we don't learn. We need to learn to be content in what it is that we have today. And maybe we'll learn, well, I know we'll learn something from Brother Zach's sermon today if we pay attention. And let's just pray for Brother Zach as he preaches uh, for us today. Okay? Let us stand this morning, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to ask for the blessing upon the offering and the tithes. And if we can have the ushers come forth. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you today. We thank you for this day, for the many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for our country. We thank you, Lord, for what you've given us. And, and most of us, we have more and above that we can use and, and, and need. And remind us, Lord, that to, to be content in whatsoever state that we, uh, that we may find ourselves today. We ask for your blessing upon the services, upon the uh, uh, tithes and offerings we're about to receive. And we'll be sure to give the praise and the glory for it is in Jesus Christ we do pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Amen. Appreciate those comments, Brother David. And that is true. We have so much to be grateful for. One of the greatest things we have to be grateful for, we're going to sing about right now, the love of God the Father for us. In spite of the fact that we don't deserve his love, we don't deserve his favor, he loves us anyway. So we'll hope you'll sing along with us. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him. in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death that
and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Think about His love. Think about His goodness. Think about His grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, for singing along with us today. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. My trials come to only make me strong Through it all, through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God Through it all, through it all I've learned I thank him for the storms he's brought me through Cause if I never had a problem I'd never know that he could solve them I wouldn't know what faith in God can do testimony this morning.
We're glad you're here to worship the Lord with us this Sunday morning here at Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church. Brother David, I think you and I, uh, we have an appreciation for the weather here in Oklahoma because we're not from here. So since we're not native Okies, uh, it means something different to us. And uh, man, when that first cold breeze starts to come down, you know, as uh, we're transitioning from summer into fall and you begin to think, ooh, it's coming. It's coming. It's on the way. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's been good to enjoy this transition weather, but we know that it, the cold is coming, right? So uh, me and the boys, we actually spent yesterday afternoon on the golf course. Steve, we only lost like 12 balls between the three of us. On about, we played about 11 holes, so we did fairly well. That was, that was really good. But uh, We had a good time yesterday. It was, uh, it was nice weather, and Lord willing, we'll get you know, a, a string of those, right? Get a little bit of nice weather for a little while. Uh, northeastern Oklahoma residents deserve all the good weather they can get, right? We struggle through so much that's not so good. Uh, Brother David, again, I appreciate you mentioning Dr. Linton. Many of you are aware of his situation to some degree. He had surgery. It's the middle of the night. Uh, let's see, what was it, going to Wednesday night into Thursday morning, right? that he had surgery and um, so they had surgery, he had surgery on his back and uh, that went well, they said. At least this is the last I've heard, Charity. You may update us a little bit more, but everything went well. They sent him home yesterday and it was a two, two hour ride home. He hadn't set up for that long a period of time. So by the time he got to his house, he was in quite a bit of pain. Uh, so still, still struggling with managing pain and what have you as he recovers. Remember Karen as well, she was squeezing, having some struggles with her asthma over the last week or so, and they actually have taken her to the doctor twice, and everything looks clear as far as her lungs, so she's on some steroids and some antibiotics. So pray for both of them, and then if you would remember, my wife, because she's down there with them, and uh, trying to help them, and not only her, but uh, Faith as well, so they're both down there. Remember them all in prayer over the next week that they will be able to recover and get back to health. You all know how Brother Linton is, man. He's go, 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 go. And so not being able to go, 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 you know that has to weigh on his heart and mind. So please be in prayer for him and for his attitude during all this that the Lord would encourage him and that he would sense his presence during this time. A couple of congratulations are in order from what I understand today. We're going to start off with... Jake and Allie. Jake and Allie got, what, what day was it? What? Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, Jake and Allie got engaged to be married. So yeah, congratulations, guys. Exciting time. Um, we were talking about that actually just this morning amongst the musicians as we were having our word of prayer, Jake. This is an update because you weren't up here for that prayer. He's not a part of that group. Uh, we were talking about the wedding, asked if a date had been set yet. She said no. But Elijah came up with a great idea, Disney World wedding at the Millennium Falcon at the Star Wars experience in Disney World. Yes. So we want to get him on board with that. I think that'd be awesome. Ali says no. One other uh, congratulations that are in order today, Ron and Peggy Graves. So we have a couple that just got engaged to be married to begin their married life. Ron and Peggy Graves. Was it yesterday you guys celebrated your anniversary? Yesterday was 56, 56 years of marriage. So let's, absolutely. If you would notice though, um, Jake and Allie, you know, Jake sits there beside her, they're holding hands, you know, they're engaged. Ron and Peggy, there's a chair in between them. They're not, they're not even sitting together anymore. It's what 56 years will do, guys, you know. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You know, but I do appreciate that, and hey, um, Peggy came up and let me know last week after I'd mentioned uh, David and Tracy. If you have an anniversary, a marriage, a wedding anniversary that comes up, I'm happy to announce that. We clap for you. I think that is something to celebrate. You know, especially God's people. God's people ought to be celebrating marriage and, and faithfulness and commitment to one another. So I think that's fantastic. Real honestly, uh, Ron and Peggy, congratulations to you both. That, that's an accomplishment. It really is. And it's something that's worth our time and attention and some congratulations. All right, we're going to give our update for our 50,000 Bible chapter challenge. Um, we didn't have quite as many participate this week. I think it's because the person who posted the, the update on the website, on the Facebook page, did it a little late, kind of off their game. And I can gripe at that person because it was me. 
So I posted it a little late yesterday, so I don't think everybody got their post in. But here's the update for what we did have uh, reported this week. 17 people participated reading 414 chapters of Scripture this week. That puts us at 39,200 total chapters reported by our church family for the year of 2023. That's having read the Bible all through entirely, or the equivalent of it, almost 33 times means our church family has spent over 1,960 hours reading and studying God's Word in 2023. So that's great. Almost to 40,000 chapters. Now I will say we've got 11 weeks left. That's hard to believe. Only 11 weeks left in 2023, but we have 11 weeks left and we're still just under 11,000 chapters shy of our 50,000 Bible chapter challenge. So I encourage you on Saturdays, if you've read any chapters at all, get on there and post Text me, text my wife. We're happy to put that on the Facebook post for you, and uh, we'll be keeping up with that through the rest of the year. All right, all that's been said. Now let's get to our message today. John chapter 5 is where we are going to be in Scripture. John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14 this morning. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. This is one of Jesus' healing miracles that he performs during his earthly ministry. And he does this miracle, performs this miracle at a place called the Pool of Bethesda. That's what John mentions here. It's interesting that for many years, uh, archaeologists said that John must have made this place up because they never found it in all their digging and study of the area, of the city of Jerusalem, they'd never come across the pool of Bethesda. So John must have been a liar until just a few years ago. And you know what they found is they were actually doing some excavations for a parking lot from what I understand. They came across a, it was empty at that time, but they came across an area that had been intended for a pool. And sure enough, it was just as John describes it in the book of John. So for centuries, they called the Bible a liar, and they found out they were wrong. And so often we see things like this happening. Archaeology is constantly proving the truthfulness of God's Word. And I think that's something worth mentioning and something to be excited about as well. So he's at the Pool of Bethesda. Now, this, these series of pools had been created initially as sort of a uh, demonstration of wealth, demonstration of God's blessing on his people. But by the time we get to the pool of Bethesda here in the book of John, that is not what we see. The scene at this point, well, if you were to imagine a battleground with a lot of wounded, dead, or dying people laying around, that's more like what the pool of Bethesda would have probably looked like in the days of Jesus. People would come there and they would come with the hopes of being miraculously healed by being the first person to touch the water when the waters were stirred. Now, we'll read that in just a moment, but the Bible does not tell us that there was indeed a healing property to this pool. The Bible does not tell us that there was indeed an angel that would come and stir the waters. What John says here in the book is that is what was commonly believed. So we don't know for certain that that is actually what happening, happened. Could God have been sending an angel from time to time to stir the waters? Absolutely. But we don't know for certain that that's actually what was occurring here. Jesus is walking amongst these people. He's there for an important feast. And so there would have been a lot of exciting things to do exciting places to visit in Jerusalem. The city would have been absolutely bustling at a season like this, and yet, as Jesus is visiting Jerusalem, we don't see him at the celebration, at least not yet. Jesus is where the hurting people are. That says a lot about Jesus. Jesus wasn't so much concerned about the celebration and the laughter and the feasting, though he did get in on that sort of stuff while he was here on earth. But his primary concern was for the hurting. Amen. And that's an encouragement to me today. Let's pick up reading in John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. 
For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then after, first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So what he's doing there, just again, I know I've mentioned this already, we need to understand how to read our Bibles. What he's doing there, he's suggesting what is believed at the time. Uh, he's not necessarily stating it as a fact, okay? Verse 5, a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is this which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. I think it's interesting as we look at this pool of Bethesda scene, John paints sort of a grim picture for us. There are a lot of very sick, hurting, wounded people lying around these pools. And I imagine many of them are discouraged because they may have been there for many years. They may have been coming down to the pool regularly for years, maybe decades, in hopes that they might find some sort of supernatural healing and help. And yet, day after day, week after month after year, they find themselves no better. And I believe in many ways this picture at the Pool of Bethesda some 2,000 years ago represents a picture of a church family gathered to worship. You say, well, how so? How do you see those two looking a lot alike? Well, physically, it may not look nearly the same. We all are in relatively good health. We, most of us came in here under our own power. We have sound minds. and We may be uh, suffering from some sicknesses and some illnesses. I know some just recently got over COVID. Glad to have Bob and Gwenda back in service with us today. And so we occasionally will experience things like that, but not sort of like what we see here at Bethesda, but we still represent a group of hurting and needy people. Every one of us has circumstances, situations in our lives we may not publicize to the whole world. It may not be obvious just by looking at us, but each of us has some sort of need, some sort of struggle, some sort of circumstance or situation, disappointment, confusion that we find in our lives today and we have a hope that it'll one day get better. We want some help. We need some healing. It may not be physical, but we need a touch from the supernatural. So many at the Pool of Bethesda were the very same. Let me ask you a question, and I just want you to think about this, and I want to answer out loud. It's a rhetorical question. But as I make this next statement, is there anything that you might be able to put in, fill in the blank with? Lord, if you would just fill in the blank. Can you put anything in that blank? I imagine most of us, if not all of us, would be able to answer that question with, yes, God, if you would just help my marriage, if you would just help my finances, if you would just help me with this situation or this relationship or this struggle, if you would just help me at work, if you would just help my business, if you would just, then I think I might feel like I could keep going, but I'm struggling and I need your help. 
I think there are many in the room today who feel much like this crippled man did. Oh, maybe it's not visible from the outside like it was with this man as he lay there on his bed of sickness. But it's just as real. And you need God's help. You find yourself with some stuff in your life that needs to be fixed. The real question that you have to answer is the title of this morning's message. Do you really want to get well? Do you really want to get well? I think we see in Jesus' exchange with the crippled man that there may have actually been a bit of hesitancy on his part. You say, that sounds ridiculous. Of course this man wants to walk. Well, yes, he does. But if that part of his life is changed, then that means there's a lot of other things in his life that are going to have to change. With the blessing will come some responsibility. And so as Jesus asked him that day, we looked at the question Jesus said, do you want to be well? I believe it's a question many of us need to ask ourselves this morning. We're going to look at four elements from this story, this event that we have recorded by John, to help us answer the question of this morning's message. First, we see the man. The man. Look with me again at verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now, we don't know much about the man. We don't even know the man's name. As a matter of fact, this man happens to be identified primarily by his problem. He's had an issue for 38 years. He's been crippled. He can't walk. Now, we don't know for sure, but because of the way that John often references people who are sick, it's believed that this 38 years does not represent his entire life. There were other times that John would describe people who had been sick, saying that they had been sick from birth. And so I think we can assume that this man was older than 38. We don't know how long of his life he had been crippled or how old he was before he was crippled, but we know that this has been his reality for 38 long years. And we have to remember that an individual who was crippled in those days would not have had access to the advantages that the physically handicapped have today here in America. And I don't say that to diminish any physical handicaps. I know they're still difficult and they're a struggle to deal with, but there weren't handicap ramps. There weren't handicap bathrooms. There weren't you know, the steps up to the temple. There wouldn't have been a ramp for the handicapped people to be wheeled up. This man's life would have been that much more inconvenient as a result of his problem and of his struggle. I can imagine this man coming to the pool day after day, year after year, hoping to find some relief, hoping to find some healing, and finally, after a while, just kind of coming to the conclusion that it's always going to be like this. It's never going to get better. There's no hope for my situation. And I wonder if there might be some of us today that may be struggling with something. Maybe it's been a while and you've come to kind of think and wonder, God, is this ever going to change? Are you ever going to help me? Will this ever be any better? This man, little did he know, there would come a day, it'd be 38 years, but there'd come a day he'd come face to face with someone who had the power to fix his problem, who had the power to assist him and give him meaningful help more than what anyone else had possibly been able to do. This man was driven by his desire to get rid of his problem. 38 years. We don't know exactly because, again, we don't know much about this man's situation, but he's either been living at the pool for a long, long time or he's been going back and forth. Man, I can only imagine the struggle 
the disappointment, the discouragement. We were just talking just a moment ago as I was requesting prayer for Brother Linton about how he's been down for the last few weeks and you guys that know him know, man, he's a get after it kind of guy. He doesn't stay, sit still for very long. And, and so you can know that's gotta be a frustration for him. And again, I'm not trying to, dis, to diminish what Brother Linton is facing because he does need help and healing and he need God, needs God to touch him and he needs to be encouraged and all that. That's, that's, that's legitimate. But imagine 38 years, 38 years. This man keeps going, keeps going to the pool over and over and over. No one, he tells Jesus, no one to help him. No one to help him get down to the pool. He's on his own. And I'm sure he felt alone in his struggle. I wonder how many in the room, though you would not want to admit it to the crowd, identify with this man. Oh, it may not be a, a visible, physical issue, but you've got a need. And you've struggled with it for so long. And you need the help of God. We see the man here. And secondly, we see the question. The question. Look with me again at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Let's stop and think about it. And we've heard this story so many times. We know where it's going, right? We, we, we've got it. But let's stop for a moment and imagine ourselves hearing this story, being there maybe nearby as Jesus is talking to this man. And he asks him, will you be made whole? Would you like to be healed? There was a comedian. He's actually still a comedian. He became famous for a certain type of joke that he would tell, and it basically went something like this. He'd tell a bunch of them, and he'd end them all the same way. You're in a parking lot, and you are standing beside your car, and you've got a coat hanger down the window of the driver's side door. Somebody pulls up beside you and asks the question, hey, did you lock your keys in your car? And then his response would be something like, no, I just washed the car and I'm hanging it out to dry. Yeah. And then he would make a statement that he became famous for. Three little words. Here's your sign, right? Most of you are familiar with that comedian. Such an obvious question that it's, it's, it's what are you thinking even asking a question? You don't have to ask. You can tell by looking at the situation the answer to the question. Why are you bothering me asking whether or not I lock my keys in my car? Don't you have enough sense to be able to look at the situation and figure out what's going on? I kind of think maybe that the crippled man might have felt a little bit that way about Jesus' question. I mean, he's at the pool of Siloam. With all these, or pool of Bethesda, pardon me, with all these other crippled, sick people needing healing. And Jesus is walking through the crowd of all these sick folks and stops at this man and says, Hey, pal, would you like to be healed? I think if this man had ever heard of this comedian I was talking about, he may have just said, Hey, buddy, here's your sign, man. I mean, come on. Get with the bro look around, man. What, what do you think? What do you think? Of course, I want to be healed. But there's more to the question than that. I touched on this a little bit in my introduction here, but as Jesus asked this man if he wants to be healed, I believe what he's trying to prompt in this man's heart and mind is the results of the healing. You see, if that man got healed, and he's able to walk on his own two feet with that blessing comes some responsibility. He can't just sit and beg anymore. People start seeing him walking around. He can't just rely on other people's pity to get by. He's going to have to start doing some things for himself. He's going to have to start earning a living. And it's been a long time since he's had to worry with something like that. So as Jesus is asking what seems like a very obvious question, I believe there are some not so obvious ramifications to the answer. 
Sir, do you want to get healed? Do you really? Do you really want to get well? Now imagine asking Jesus asking you the same question today about whatever it is may be your struggle or your problem this morning. Do you really want to be healed of those past hurts? Do you really want to be set free from that secret sin? Do you really want to overcome that addiction? Do you really want to see your marriage restored? Do you really want to put down the bitterness and become a forgiving person? Do you really want to be reconciled to your children? Do you really want to get a handle on your tongue and on your anger? And the list could go on and on and on and on. But I think you understand the point I believe we're trying to make in this point here this morning is that if Jesus is going to meet our needs, then there are times that we are going to have some responsibilities as a result. God, help me to forgive so-and-so. Just use this as a for example. Do you really want God to help you to forgive him? Or is it more comfortable to hold on to that hurt? And to soothe yourself in a way with the bitterness of what they've done to you and how hurt and wronged you feel. I'm talking to somebody. That's, hey, do you really, do you really want to get well? I'm convinced that there are some people, they think they want God to help them, but when it really boils down to it, they don't. Because though they want the blessing, they are not interested in the responsibility. This man gets healed, all of a sudden he's got a lot he's responsible for. So do you really want to get well? The man, the question number three, look at the excuse with me. You may not have thought of it this way when we read it earlier. That's kind of what we see here in verse 7 of John 5. The impotent man answered him. Now remember, what did Jesus say? He said, he asked the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Look at how the man responds. Verse 7, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you recognize that reference. He was feeling pretty sorry for himself. Feeling pretty bad about things. I mean, Jesus asks, do you want to be healed? And the man doesn't answer the question. Do you see that? He says, well, ain't nobody around here to help me. Nobody will do anything for me. Nobody cares nothing about me. I've been crippled for 38 years. I mean, it almost in his response, I can kind of see he's wanting to tug at Jesus' pity. You know what I think the man really wants here? He, here's, here's just my opinion. This isn't necessarily in the Bible. This is my assumption based on what I've studied. I think what this man saw was an opportunity to get a little something out of somebody that stopped and paid him some attention. He was hoping maybe I get a few coins out of this man. Maybe I get a few pesos. I know they didn't have pesos in Jerusalem, but you get what I'm saying. Maybe I get a few, a little bit of something I can spend to help make my existence a little more tolerable. And so he's trying to get Jesus to feel sorry for him. I have no one, no one to help poor little old crippled up me. You know what that is? That's an excuse. Amen. That's not an answer to Jesus' question. Jesus looks at him and he <laughs> clearly has no idea who he's talking to. Jesus looks at him and says, do you want to be healed? And the man gives him an excuse. Here's why things are so bad. Here's why it's, some, it's somebody else's fault. Come on, somebody. It's somebody else's fault. I've been crippled for 38 years, and do you want to be healed? Well, let me tell you why I'm still crippled. 
because it's somebody else's fault. Friend, I'm preaching where you and me live right now. The pain, the struggle, the frustration that we often find ourselves in, it is so convenient to blame it on somebody else. If they would just change the way they think, if they would just stop doing this, if they would just quit saying that, if they had never done this, if they, if they, if they, if they, and it's always somebody else's fault. We never are willing to take any responsibility on ourselves. Why do you struggle with being so angry at these people? Maybe you have a problem with anger. Again, that's just, and I'm not trying to harp on that. That's just a for instance, but that, that's so often the case. We are unwilling to see our responsibility and the part that we may play in our struggle, in our difficulty. And Jesus says, do you want to be well? And then all of a sudden he starts talking about how nobody else is willing to help him. We can be this way too. Imagine if you were standing there beside that man that day. Imagine if you're there knowing then what you know right now and what this man apparently didn't know at the moment. Knowing that this is the miracle working son of God come from heaven. All he has to do, we talked about this last Sunday, all he has to do is say the word. He doesn't even have to touch this man. He doesn't have to take him to a doctor, give him a pill, any of those things. All he has to do is say the word. Imagine if you're standing beside this crippled man some 2,000 years ago, knowing then what you know right now. And there was a pause in the conversation, and he looked at you to respond. What would you say to that crippled man? How would you respond? Just think another rhetorical question. How would you respond? Jesus, the miracle working son of God, he asked the crippled man, do you want to be healed? And the crippled man says, well, look around, sir. No, look at all these people. Look at all these people that are standing around with healthy bodies. Not a one of them will help me. And then he looks to you. What would you say to that man? I believe if it were me, I'd say something to the akin, akin to Friend, you don't know who you're talking to. You have, you have no idea who it is that you are talking to right now. You have no idea who it is that you're dealing with right now. He's not just asking you a question just to pass the time. He's not just asking you this question because he pities you. He's asking you the question because he can do something about it. May I remind you this morning? that that's the same person you and I are dealing with? Come on, somebody. We talk about our troubles and our struggles and our frustrations and our confusions, and it's always going to be this way, and I don't know why, what's going to happen, what are we going to do? God, if you would just remember who it is you're dealing with. Remember when you take those needs to God in prayer, who it is you're talking to. You may not be able to hear him like the crippled man could. You may not be able to see him yet like the crippled man could. But that doesn't mean that he's not there and he doesn't care. He's concerned about your needs. And I believe he's asking many of us today, do you really want my help? Do you really want to get well? Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Jesus wants not only to help us, but he wants to do more in our lives than we even think possible. Doesn't mean he'll do it the way that we expect him to, but he wants to do more than we even think possible. The man, the question, the excuse, and number four. I could have broken this off into a few more points, but for time's sake, I thought I'd only break it into four. Lastly, we see the offer. The offer. Look with me at verses 8 into the first part of verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, I think it's so interesting here. Jesus asks him the question. The man just uses excuses. He tries to point blame at other people. And Jesus doesn't bother with all of that. Do you notice that? Jesus doesn't sit down and try to become his psychiatrist. Well, pal, let me tell you, you've really got your thinking wrong and you really need to, you know, if you just this seven-step process or this 12-step program or what had, he doesn't go to any of that. And I'm not saying that there aren't 
however many step programs that don't have some value to those who need the help. I'm not saying that there's never a, a legitimate need for a psychiatrist or a psychologist, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, to poo-poo on any of that. But it's interesting to me that Jesus cuts through all of that. And he just simply says, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And there's the offer. I do think it's interesting. Jesus doesn't say, you're healed. You see that? Jesus doesn't just say, well, you know what? Today is your lucky day, pal. I am the miracle working son of God. And bibbity bobbity boo. <laughs> Nothing like that. He simply says, rise. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. He's, he's, he's healed him. He's healed him. But he's intent on getting the crippled man involved in the process. Now, am I suggesting that God saves or forgives based on what we do? You know that's not what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting any sort of works salvation or works forgiveness or no, no, no. But we clearly see that, G and by the way, this is a pattern we see regularly throughout the Gospels as Jesus works miracles. Rather than just simply say, okay, let it be done as you have asked. I heal you. Jesus gives him something to do. And this man has to rise and take up his bed and walk. Now, has God healed him? Yes. But he has to step forward in faith and act on what he believes God has already done for him. And so today, I think we may have struggles and problems and issues that maybe no one else in the room is even aware of. And God is trying to help us and wants to get us involved in the answer, in meeting the need, in healing, in whatever it may, wisdom for the decisions coming our way, whatever it may be, God wants us to step forward in faith. Just, I, I hope I don't embarrass her. Uh, I, I didn't ask her permission to say this, but this past week I went up to see Pat Taylor, uh, who's in the hospital. I do remember Sister Pat, Tracy's mother, who's in the hospital and uh, still needing prayer. She's struggling to breathe, get their oxygen that she needs. Um, as I was on my way up, Tracy's walking down through the lobby. And so I stopped and she kind of gave me an update as to what was going on to her mother. Ho Tracy, I hope I'm not saying more than I should. Please forgive me if I di didn't ask you ahead of time. At one point, the doctor said or the nurse says, you may want to call your family up. This, this may be about to end. And so Tracy, of course, as she's even recounting it at the moment, she's, her eyes begin to tear up. She begin, her eyes begin to water. She begins to get a little bit of emotional. And she said, I did. She called her sister. And I remember her saying, she said, I called my sister. I can't remember specifically, but she said, God is still good. God is still good. Amen. As far as she knew, she was moments away from losing her mother to this life. But she said, God is still good. Here's my point. That's a statement of faith because it didn't feel that way at the moment. God didn't feel good right then to Tracy. I didn't ask her that, but I'm sure that's it. He didn't feel good at the moment. There's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of concern, worry about the future and what's about to happen. But it was, just, it was a statement of faith. God is still good. Even when I can't feel him, even when I can't sense it, even when my emotions tell me the opposite, God is still good. And I'm going to operate on that truth on faith. I'm just going to keep walking on faith that God is good, though I can't see how he's good right now. And I believe that's where many of us need to get there's some situations we may be struggling with and God's calling us to rise, take up our bed and walk, walk in faith. I may not see how he's meeting the need, but I believe he will. I don't see how he's giving me the, 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 the strength and the, the wisdom that I need for the, the frustrations or the confusions that I'm facing, but I believe that he will. Walk in faith. 
He calls this man to take him at his word. And that's what he calls each and every one of us to do as well. Take him at his word. Believe what he's promised. And live in it. Though you may not see how to walk ahead. This crippled man had to do more than lie on his bed to accept Jesus' offer of healing. And the same can be said for you and I. Maybe apologizing to a spouse and taking ownership of your part of the mess in your marriage. Maybe trusting God and honoring him with the first fruits of your wealth each week or month. That's what we call tithing, 10%. I'm just going to stop and park on this for a split second. We're going to keep on dancing, okay? There are many in the room aren't trusting God with your income. You're not trusting God with what he has so richly blessed you with. You're not giving a 10% tithe. You're not taking into the storehouse. By the way, that's not just something we see in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. Paul tells them to, to lay up as you come to the house, as you, as you come to worship, you lay up what God's blessed you with. That's a, that's a, that's a Bible command. It's not a suggestion, by the way. It's a command. And I, I'll stop here and say this. I'm so grateful I was raised in a household where tithing was taught from the time I was a child. It just makes sense to me. I, 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 I've, I've, I've tithed from the time I was a kid. I've tithed. I've given 10% and I'm grateful for that. And it's not because I'm good or because I'm holy. That, that's not it. My, my parents trained me to. It was, it was a grace of God shown in my life. And I can imagine if I'm an adult and I've never given 10% of my income, that's a big step of faith. Amen. I get it, guys, I do. Yeah. But I believe in that instance, Amen. God is saying to some of you, rise, yeah. take up your bed, Amen. and walk. Yeah. Okay, I'm done with the money part, all right? Maybe forgiving the person who wrongs you and letting it go. Maybe picking up your Bible and spending a few more moments reading it and praying for God to speak to your mind and heart as you read. There's so many different ways that we can walk in faith and believe on God's promises in our lives. I'm going to wrap up this study with a look at the end of the story. Verse 14 Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now we can draw a few conclusions from that. One, Jesus seems to indicate that the reason this man had been crippled for 38 years was because of his own sin. I don't know exactly how all that works, okay? And I'm not going to step out and make a lot of assumptions and say a lot of haughty things that I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I do believe that's what Jesus is getting at here. And Paul even talks about how there are some among the church that he was writing to that were sick and some were even dead because of sin. So this man has been healed. But notice Jesus says, sin no more. You know what Jesus is saying to this man? I know that what you've received today is wonderful. And we see that by the man's response. But there's something more important than physical healing. Amen. There's something more important than having your legs healed. Mark 2 verse 17 Jesus touches on this in this passage. He says, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Friend, there are, there are needs in our lives that are greater than the ones we think are the biggest needs. We have spiritual needs. We need forgiveness. We need to be in right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a far greater need than anything else we may be facing today. I'm almost done, but I want to share this thought with you. Fanny Crosby. Many of you have heard, many of you have heard of Fanny Crosby. Raise your hand. You know that name. Some of us, yeah. Not quite as popular a name anymore with the advent of as much popular worship music as we have today, but, but she was a prolific hymn writer. Lived in the 1800s. As a matter of fact, we sang one of her songs uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Blessed Assurance. 
to one of Fanny Crosby's songs and many other famous hymns. She was talking with a preacher friend one day. Oh, let me stop. For those of you who don't know who Fanny Crosby was, she was also blind. Been blind from, from couldn't remember ever seeing. She'd been blind for so long. Very, very small child when she was afflicted with blindness. So a preacher friend was talking to her one day and basically made the comment, not realizing how hurtful what he was about to say may be. He said, uh, I think it's a real shame, a real pity, Sister Fanny, that God didn't bless you with sight along with these other wonderful gifts that he's given you. Such a creative mind, such a spiritual heart. And you know what Fanny Crosby's response was? She said this, and she's quoted as saying this. Do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? The woman's been blind all her life. She says to this man, you know, if, if I had been able to make one request the day of my birth, it would be that I'd be born blind. What are you talking about, sister? She says, because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a testimony of a person who knew what it was like to experience the help of God in the middle of her need. There's a woman that no outside circumstance can ever crush because she knows Jesus. There's a greater need than whatever need you may be facing immediately in your life today, and that is to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Friend, if you don't know him today, I encourage you. I encourage you to come get well. Come get healed. A spiritual healing today. Do you really want to get well? Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and what we've read of it this morning. Thank you for encounters that we see like this one. You dealing with an individual who had so much confusion, he didn't understand you. He was confused and you're there to help and yet he's saying things that could have easily frustrated you. Yet we see your grace, your patience, your forbearance, your love. But you ask him a very important question. Friend, do you really want to be healed? Do you really want to get better? And I believe it's a question that we all need to take to heart this morning. Do we really want your help? Do we really, are we really willing to accept the responsibilities that may come with your help? Help us today, dear Lord, to say yes. Give us the courage and the wisdom to say yes, to step out in faith in spite of what circumstances may surround us. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're just going to have a few moments stillness. The Holy Spirit has spoken to your mind and heart through the word of God today. I want to encourage you to come to one of these altars. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to try to get you down here. But I do want to give you an opportunity to. I believe that moments like this, where perhaps the Lord has spoken to you in a real meaningful way, now's the time to respond. Right now is the time to respond to what God may be trying to do in your mind and heart this morning. I know you can pray later. I know you can go home and pray. But it'll be that much easier to justify never doing business with God. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your mind and heart today, while the music plays softly, and you sit quietly, I want to encourage you to come.
head bowed and eyes closed. So we wait for just another moment. You continue to read this man's story, continue to read the account here. In John, you see this man ends up in the temple praising God. He ends up uh, looking for Jesus. Of course, we read where Jesus comes back to see him. But from what we can see, we only know a part of the story. It appears that this man was willing to take up the responsibility of the blessing that he'd been given that day. And I just wonder how often we miss out on blessings from God because we're unwilling to accept the responsibility that comes with the blessing to do our part. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that we have a part to play in God saving us, not at all. But I do, we play a, I do believe we play a part in the rest of what God does with us here in this life. Thanks so much today for your attendance, your attentiveness. You can look this way, Brother David. Go ahead and make your way to the platform for announcements. I just have one announcement. Brother David will have the rest for you. Our men's Wednesday breakfast at 10 a.m. The men that were at breakfast this past Wednesday decided that we're going to visit another restaurant this coming Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. We've been at Mom's Diner. We're going to be at the Big Biscuit in Owasso. You can just tell by the name, the Big Biscuit. You know that's good. So uh, if you can, meet us at the Big Biscuit in Owasso at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. If you don't know where that is, be sure and see me and I'll get you there. Brother David. Another great sermon, brothers. I appreciate that. If you enjoy that today, say amen. Amen. Job, he said, though he slain me, yet will I trust him. And Job said that when he lost everything, he didn't say that when he was in good health. So that was a really, a really great message there, Brother Zach. Uh, if you would please just uh, bear with me. We have a few uh, announcements here. Uh, first one is the last Friday of October, the 27th, uh, will be a Cornerstone Christian Academy's annual festival uh, fall. Uh, we will have a chili supper, uh, inflatables, and carnival games for the kids, and an auction. Please, um, please plan to uh, come out uh, for, a, uh, for the uh, fun evening. So this will be Friday, October the 27th. Uh, there will be a uh, chili supper and games for everyone. So just please keep that in mind and try to uh, be here uh, with us. Second announcement, our annual truck or treat um, uh, outre outreach will be Sunday evening, October the 29th. Uh, we'd love to have 40 tr uh, trunks uh, for our event. Uh, please sign up on the uh, church bulletin board. So this will be October the 29th, uh, uh, truck and tr uh, treat. So just keep that um, uh, in mind, okay? And the last one, um, uh, don't forget our Wednesday night adventure club that's um, on the way uh, for our kids. Our services start at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings. And I believe we had about 17 kids this last Wednesday. Uh, this was our first uh, Wednesday with uh, the program for the kids. So if you have little ones, if you want to bring them out, uh, this will be on Wednesdays starting at 6.30. And uh, they'll, be, uh, they'll have uh, a lot of things for the little ones. So just keep that in mind, okay? If there's anything else, if not, let us all stand. And we're going to be uh, dismissed uh, in prayer here uh, this morning. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you today. We thank you again, Heavenly Father, for your many blessings. We thank you again for another great, powerful sermon from uh, our pastor. We pray, Heavenly Father, we may take this to heart and um, to know, Lord, that you are good and you're good all the time. We ask, Heavenly Father, for your blessing upon the prayer requests that were mentioned here this morning. Uh, you know who is out. You know who is uh, struggling right now. You know who's in the hospital. Uh, you know who's traveling right now. We ask, Heavenly Father, for your mighty hand over them. And just watch over us and keep us and bring us back again next appointed time. And we'll be sure to give the praise and the glory for this. In Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen.